facilities that make this program possible are provided by the City of Highland Park. Programs are produced independently by members of the community. The City of Highland Park is not affiliated with the following program or the producers of public access programming and is not responsible for the content. The following program does not reflect the opinions of the City of Highland Park. And welcome to Commons Current Events Roundtable. Today we have an extraordinary guest who I'm very proud to bring on our show today. And his name is Joe Kopsik, who is the author of Libertarian Conspiracy Theories. And our show, the title of our show is What is Libertarianism? And Joe Thank you for coming. I welcome you to our show today. Thanks for having me. And I'm glad to um, really talk about, uh, you have two books here. You have The Libertarian Conspiracy Theories, and you also have Soft Communism for 90s Kids. And we're going to be doing that Soft Communism for 90s Kids on our next show with you. But today we're going to really focus on libertarianism and what it really is about. Because many of us, we hear the word, oh, he's a libertarian, or they're a libertarian. And I'll talk to many people and I'll say, what do you think a libertarian is? And they say, well, somebody that doesn't want government interference. And I said, what is that also about? And nobody knows. And I think that's why I brought you on the show today, because we have no idea, really, because, um, and I think we talked about it at lunch today, you know, at the Bluegrass, because um, I was talking about to the owner, and I said, what do you think is a libertarian? And she didn't, she also wasn't sure, you know, so if she's not sure, I'm not sure, and you're on my show, and people around, we need to have more libertarians to tell us what really is going on. And I know they've been trying to become governors, they've been trying to become uh, president even, but how can we elect any uh, libertarian if we really don't understand who they are, or what they are, what libertarianism is all about and that's why I brought you into the show so right. what is a libertarian uh, Joe well someone who wants a s small government limited government free market economics personal and social freedom uh, freedom of uh, economic opportunity uh, we want the government out of your pocketbook and out of your bedroom um, a lot of people say libertarians are socially liberal and fiscally conservative I would say a better descriptor is a socially tolerant and fiscally responsible so how does that differ than um, a Republican or a Democrat? I mean, um, I mean, Republicans also they don't they want more limited government. Where I think Democrats want more government. I, I can understand that. So how does that differ being a Libertarian and a let's say a Republican? What what would be the difference? Well, first off, uh, libertarian is not just something a Republican can be. It's also something a Democrat or a Socialist can be. Um, so we want to make sure that Republicans don't you know, subsidize uh, domestic trade and uh, don't interfere with the economy to protect big businesses or really any kind of business. We want a totally free market economy, uh, totally free of subsidies, where every uh, service the government provides is viewed as a, as a free market, you know, subject to, to market forces. Because we want to have a voluntary taxation that we can be convinced of, not extorted from us. And we want to have totally voluntary participation in all government programs, and wherever possible, have user fees and fee-for-service models. So, what? That's a, that's a mouthful. Um, I have to figure out what exactly did you say just now? Um, we now the Republicans don't want to have as much government either, but you think they still want more government than the Libertarians? Is that what you're saying? I think yeah. Once they get a hold of those national offices, I think the special interests uh, all too often kind of buy them out, and instead of abolishing these unconstitutional departments, they just kind of let them continue to exist and you know 
unfortunately, the Secretary's cabinet members try to make, to make some money off it, so I'm a bit disappointed in Trump, kind of saw it, a little bit saw it coming, so I supported Gary Johnson. Okay. Yeah, but the, the, but the thing is how, you know, everybody comes into government. I mean, everybody has the, you know, I'm going to do this, you know, and when I come into go, you know, when I come, I'm the president or I'm the governor or I, you know, I'm a senator, this is what I'm going to be doing. And when they come in, it's not as easy said, you know, it's easier said than done. How do, could they, how could a libertarian all of a sudden abolish a lot of the government programs. I mean, how do, how can they do that? You know, they could say they want to do it, but how can it be done? You know, when they come into office, how does that work? Mm. And I also want to say, um, d Democrats kind of want people to believe that libertarians want to leave poor people out to dry, that we want to um, gut the social welfare state. I would say, you know, if we abolish corporate privilege, maybe a social safety net would not even be as necessary because then we wouldn't be, you know, taxing uh, taxing poor people at all. Uh, so they'd be able to, you know, have better economic opportunity and create jobs and work to keep their own money and buy government services themselves in the way that they see fit. Um, but yeah, we have to guard against the excesses of cronyism of the, and big business of, uh, of Republicans and guard against the impulse to have a big central government, uh, the Democrats. And we have to get each party to return to an embrace of uh, civil liberties and the Bill of Rights. Okay, but if we don't have any taxes, how do the how do things get paid for? Like how do um, infra infrastructure, like roads and bridges, and um, you know everything that's kind of breaking down right now? I mean, we're in the city, uh, you know, in Illinois and Chicago. There's a lot of things that need to be done, and for some reason, with and we're probably one of the highest property taxes in in the nation, uh, Illinois, uh, Chicago especially, and Lake County, uh, and yet we don't get any infrastructure. What do they do with this money? And if we put, say, our states, you know, it, 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 according to libertarianism, the states would take over. How would Illinois take over if they can't even manage their own state right now? Mm. So um, I think uh, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, education, um, I think those would all be things that the state, uh, libertarians would want the states to handle rather than the federal government. And the way to make sure that states don't, uh, you know, the states manage their budgets properly, we need to be taxing the right things. And I think right now people in Lake County especially, also everyone in the New York metropolitan area, feel that they're paying way too many uh, property taxes. And I think the solution is something that uh, economist Henry George proposed, the late 19th century New York economist, um, came up with something called land value taxation. He advocating taxing, uh, advocated taxing not the property value, but the land value. So don't tax uh, the improvements upon property uh, because that's productive activity. The same reason you don't tax income because it takes away all the incentive to produce and earn money when you're taxing it away. I think we talked about something that um, recently um, that was kind of interesting that when, when we were talking about it at lunch, we, we just talked about, um, I just got an underground water, um, water system so my lawn can be, you know, taken care of. I paid $3,000 and to water my lawn. And uh, so it comes up, I don't have to stand there with a hose. and. Uh, I understood afterwards, after I put it in, I was supposed to get a permit. Now a permit, I would have to pay for a permit to water my own lawn, and part of my lawn belongs to the city. It isn't my lawn, it's the lawn by the curb. It's after, you know, people have their lawn, then there's a sidewalk, then the, the lawn by the street is the lawn that is owned by the city. Now I'm supposed to get a permit, pay for a permit, to water their lawn, and 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 I and I don't really have to water their lawn, but in, but everybody does water the lawn of the the curb lawn, whatever you know that is called. There's a name for that, the lawn by the curb, I call it. Mm -hmm. And yet they want a property. They wanted me to to get a permit and pay for a permit. I did not mm -hmm. know that, and I went and put it underneath, and I I heard that I was supposed to get a permit to water their lawn. Mm -hmm. besides my own. What do you think? Is that something that the, what the libertarians, what would they say about that? Yeah, I think libertarians and Georgists alike uh, could not get behind what the city's doing on that. You know, the owner of the property should be paying the taxes. And in this case, the owner of that small parcel of property is the city government. 
And so, uh, this all ties into the idea that rent is theft, but I think I should probably talk about uh, libertarians say taxation is theft. What we really mean by that is that uh, taxation is extortion or that taxation without representation is theft. Um, I think taxes would be much lower if we just knew what to tax and we're taxing destructive rather than productive activity. And I think if the federal government didn't you know, normalize the idea that we should have primarily sales taxes, income taxes, and property taxes funding everything we do, we would have more reliance on voluntary contributions, user fees, taxes on uh, things that lead to the blight of land, misuse of land, exclusion of people from land without compensating the community. So it's kind of like, I mean, nowadays, I think we also talked about when I was, um, when I was living in the city with my parents, and that was some time ago, um, in the 40s and 50s, and I remember my parents, their rent on their apartment was $69.50. I remember the 50 cents, because I remember when, my, when it up, went up 50 cents, and my mother said, oh my God, it's going up 50 cents. And, um, and now, and, and they said, oh, people will say, well, that was when salaries were low, and people, that's the type of rent that they charge, but salaries weren't were, were that low. I mean, people earn maybe, uh, you know, 20, 30, some people $40,000, a year and a lot of people you know I know our our kids they that's what they earn uh, school teachers they're school teachers they're owning earning thirty dollars thirty thousand dollars a year thirty five thousand dollars and forty thousand dollars and they're paying uh, twenty two thousand to twenty five hundred dollars for a one-bedroom apartment now Tell me, how could it go up from sixty-nine fifty for almost the same salary to twenty-five hundred dollars a month rent? And this is why I depart from most of my party, uh, probably about ninety-five percent of them, uh, in saying that rent is theft and rent is extortion. There are tremendous amounts of economic pressure on the renter, but also the landlord, to extract rent from the la uh, from the renter. Um, and I think you know, inflation, uh, runaway deficit spending, and unlimited borrowing, um, unbalanced government budgets speculation in the housing and land markets. I think those are all things that, that have led to this uh, you know, expensive housing and expensive rent. And I think uh, it's government and it's, it's cronies that kind of you know, keep that system alive. So the people that are paying rent then are really, pay, they're paying, uh, when their property tax goes up, the, the person that owns the apartment building, the renters are actually paying for the man's or the person's property tax. Right? Is that what you're saying? I think sometimes if the uh, if the landlord chooses to have that, you know, to, to pass on that responsibility. Well, to he the must have it in the rent if he's charging two and three thousand dollars for like a, a one bedroom, or sometimes they're even charging for a efficiency or a, a one, you know, a no, you know, one a bedroom a bedroomless apartment. What it's called a you know one of those small apartments without a bedroom, um, and they're charging almost $2,000 a month rent for those. And so it must be that the rent, the person that's renting to them, you're actually paying for all their taxes and property taxes, and they're collecting twice then. They're collecting from everybody. Say there's uh, 30 apartments in the building. Then how their they're, people are paying for, he's getting really a lot of money, right? Because that property tax is not running that high, and they're all paying like $2,000 and $3,000 a month rent. Yeah, well, um, Lake County is, I think, that probably 16th out of 3,000 U.S. counties in terms of uh, how high the property taxes are. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, th I think... Uh, so the, the renters are actually, it's passing it on to them. Yeah, w when they do that, I think that is irresponsible. It's an outsourcing responsibility to pay for that space. And um, I think there would be a lot less uh, rental. I think there would be a lot more ownership um, if we had uh, a free market economy and you know, more voluntary exchange than command and control economics like we have now. Yeah, because that's happening all over Chicago, downtown, because that's where a lot of the young people live, you know, kids that got out of college and they have their first job and they're maybe, maybe the job isn't more than thirty-five to $40,000 that they're making a year. And, and they're... I, 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 you said it's not just uh, theft, it's extortion. Yeah, people f all over the county and all over the state feel like they're being priced out of their homes, and it's just too bad that we, we, government can't come up with some way uh, for us, for our property values to rise without our property taxes rising too. Now, Joe, what, how did you um, 
get to all of this, what is your educational prof and professional background, political background? How do you, how did you, how do you know all about this? For such a young person, you seem to know all about, you know, liberalism, socialism, um, and we're going to get to some of these uh, different anarchism uh, and some of these things. How did you find? What what is your um, way that you learned and how did this come about and and also how did these books come about sure. i mean these are amazing books Thank libertarian you. conspiracy theories and soft communism for 90s kids that is that, that's funny we'll have to get to that that's a play on yeah. words so a background uh, uh, about me i'm 30 i'm from lake bluff illinois i went to lake forest high school um, i went to university of wisconsin at madison where i started majoring in legal studies switched courses to political science uh, my father's a lawyer my brother's a lawyer and um, I put all my college writing on my blog and I turned it into uh, um, these two books of 45 uh, best essays from that from those 10 years of writing since uh, the middle of college and I became a libertarian in 2007 I was first a Green Party and Democrat supporter because I was raised in a Democratic household uh, but in 2007 I was into Dennis Kucinich and Mike Gravel and the next day after the Democratic debate, I discovered Ron Paul and started researching all the things he was talking about, and I agreed with almost uh, all of it. Is that something in this day and age that, um, you know, younger people are going into more of this? I mean, there's so much anger out there right now with the Democrats, with the Republicans, um, and that was one of the reasons why President Trump actually got elected, because people were so sick of their, you know, the Democratic Party, they were sick of the Republican Party, and I would consider him more of a populist than either one of the parties. He seems to have a little of it, each of it in him, but um, is that where more of the younger people your age is kind of going to liberalism, more as libertarians? Is that what you think uh, more so our age group, you know, your parents' age group, your grandparents' age group, uh, they, they were always either Democrats or Republicans. Mm. And now uh, there's more power, like in Europe and in Israel and all around the di different parts of the country, there's always more than two parties. Yeah, and I that's something I admire about uh, Israel's uh, one, um, see what single house uh, parliament, it's a 120 seat Knesset. Um, and they let any party that receives more than 1% uh, get at least one seat in the national legislature. I think it's, uh, I think they have better participatory democracy th than we do. Um, sorry, I, I want to answer the other part of your question though. What was well, that was, that was the part, you know, that um, our, our younger yeah. people, our younger people going into m being a, a libertarian. You don't see as many um, our age group. Right. That's, um, um, so I think uh, I saw an article describing, the, an article that is titled something like, they're saying millennials are, are more conservative than previous generations. Really, they're more libertarian. I think uh, most people in my generation, uh, the millennials, I was born in 1987, I think most of us are really skeptical about both big government and, uh, big, and big businesses. So I think um, you know, the, the increase in the membership of the Green Party and Libertarian Party and even Socialist too, uh, I think that, that kind of mirrors that, you know, that, that healthy skepticism you know, to beware of government uh, and crony corporate uh, collusion. Why are they so worried about big government? Why is that so scary? Well, a libertarian will probably tell you, and I'll tell you, uh, you know, about tw 200 million people in the 20th century uh, died at the hands of governments or armies or because of government mismanagement of uh, distribution of resources. Um, and 55 million of those, uh, according to a, a professor at the University of Hawaii's uh, calculations, 55 million of those were uh, in countries that had legally disarmed their populations. Uh, so we want to protect gun rights, um, g gun freedoms. Not that I'm necessarily a gun enthusiast or a gun nut or even a gun owner or user. Um, but yeah, we want to guard against the excesses of central government, make sure they can't exercise some kind of draft or you know, track people, have, have registries of people or have certain political persuasions or, or, or religion. Huh. So what is the difference between then being a liberal or li libertarianism and socialism and communism? Uh, it, it sounds a little bit uh, like uh, Karl Marx's theory um, somewhat. Um, what, maybe you could explain to us what the difference is. Yeah, so there are a lot of libertarians who kind of express a desire to recapture the term liberal because in, in its original, you know, 
since 250 years ago it meant a classical liberal. Now it means a modern, more left-wing liberal. Um, but it more resembled what libertarianism is now if you view you know, classical liberalism, what it meant 250 years ago. And um, that's to have you know, s severe limits on, on government powers and have real negotiation between the states and the people and the federal government as to who gets to control you know, what policy areas. Um, well, wasn't communism supposed to be, or, car or maybe socialism, I'm using the wrong um, terminology, wasn't everybody was supposed to be equal, it was, her, it was Karl Marx's theory that everybody would get the same, everyone would, would get a house or a piece of property and they would, everybody would be the same and somehow it didn't work out. Yeah, I think um, making sure people have their basic needs, I think that's definitely a goal of uh, liberalism. It's a goal of uh, some forms of socialism. Marx viewed socialism as a way to have a temporary state on the way to an anarcho-communist society, a stateless, money moneyless, classless society. Um, liberalism is not as far left uh, as, as socialism. Uh, socialism wants something more radical, which is social or collective ownership of the means of production. Um, so, contrary to what a lot of people believe, you know, socialists don't necessarily want a big welfare state. They want a welfare state to be unnecessary um, because people will actually be able to own land and, uh, you know, hopefully cooperatively and keep what they earn on their own land. But, so, uh, so, by yeah. having uh, a non-welfare state, you feel that um, right now a lot of people, like if you go to California, there are so many people like, just sitting on the ground and, um, you know, homeless and, uh, and you feel that um, they would not have to be, how, how, would, how would that solve the problem being a libertarian where you wouldn't have the homeless sitting on grounds and sitting on blankets and begging? I mean, we have that in Chicago. You go downtown Chicago and you see a lot of beggars and you see a lot of them even in the street, you know, uh, when you stop at a stoplight and they're going from one car to another trying to get money from you. How would... How is socialism, or not socialism, but libertarianism, how would that prevent uh, this type of problem? Yeah, so the libertarian impulse to solve problems, typically the first thing we think of is how can we get government out of the way? So in this case, we would just say, how is the government stopping homeless people from getting what they need to survive? Uh, one thing is government could relax homesteading laws, make it easy for people to, to uh, you know, change a property and live on it, especially a lot of these abandoned uh, transportation infrastructure properties that are going to waste. You know, they're building spikes on them to keep homeless people from, from living under them when they could easily shelter people. Uh, another thing is to not mandate homeless people to have IDs, or at least if you mandate them to have IDs, uh, have a way to pay for it so they're not stuck trying to recover their identification documents for months at a time just so they can get jobs and money. It's like, you have to have money in order to get an ID, you have to have ID in order to get money and have a job. It's, you know. So this would prevent being homeless then? P people, I mean, it, this would be more equal opportunity for them. It would, um, making it uh, possible for people to fully own property and to, to inherit property to some extent, you know, as long as they're not destroying their land and destroying the property values of the people around them, I think it would make it easier. Um, you know, there are market mechanisms that can take care of poor people. Um, government all too often wastes the money uh, when it, and then it demands more money because it's a, you know, basically a racketeering operation. They create a problem, they, you know, find a way to take our money to pretend to solve it. Now, you know, it's interesting, Joe, that, um, I mean, you're here today, and most people don't know anything about anything that you're talking about. <laughs> you know, you're, it's, uh, it's unusual. Why are people that are libertarians not going on national television stations? You know, I, I watch on Sunday morning. I must go from one station to the other. I go from CBS to NBC, CNN to Fox News, MSNBC to One American News. I mean, there are so many news stations and so many uh, roundtable discussion groups. I mean, it's just the two of us today, but most of the roundtable discussion groups are big roundtables, and they have uh, multiple people that are on. Why aren't anybody from the Libertarian Party ever get on these shows? I think it's because they're really afraid of what we have to say. They're afraid the Libertarians are going to criticize uh, government, big government. They're, if a Green got on, they'd be afraid they criticize the government in addition to the corporate interests that are, uh, that are backing them. And... Um, 
you know, the, a lot of people don't realize, you know, after the League of Women Voters moderated the presidential debates, I think sometime in the 90s they changed that, and now it's controlled by uh, an, basically an independent um, private corporation that's controlled by the former heads of the Democratic and Republican Party. It's the de uh, Commission on Presidential Debates. And um, I think actually two days from now, Gary Johnson is going to be in D.C. trying to sue and make sure that uh, the next presidential debates um, have have more room for third party candidates. And the problem is that you know you need to be in the polls to get into the debates. You need to be in the debates to get into the polls. That's something Gary Johnson repeated a lot in 2016. Yeah, because um, I remember him on one show, and because he couldn't remember when they asked him what uh, what's going to happen in Aleppo, or you know, and, and they and he said Aleppo. Um, because he just wasn't, it wasn't that he didn't know about Aleppo, it just was one of those questions that you'd think, uh, sometimes you get thrown a question and you just can't think of it. You know, you have a, what we call senior moments. Um, but, uh, you know, they made such fun of him, and every comedian, every, uh, st every station was making fun of him, and all the comedians that had their own, you know, their shows, you know, with uh, all these John Stewart's and all these other people. I mean, the first thing they talked about, oh, what's Aleppo? You know, that was the that was when they, how they started their programs. Yeah, uh, that's something a president should know, and Gary Johnson admitted that. Um, but he did know it. It just that he just at that point he didn't uh, he wasn't sure of the you know what what it was at the moment. Yeah, and the rest of the clip, he totally explains what his policy on Syria is. It's just he didn't remember that particular name of that particular city. And uh, the media pounced all over him. He was nearing the 15% mark he needed to get to get into the presidential debates. He was at 10 to 13 nationally. And then he slipped to 4 or 5% within a few weeks because the media just would not let it go. I think it's a little bit unfair. He should have known that, but, you know, it's not the biggest deal. But, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the people that were on the shows, you know, the, the, the uh, the debates, actually the debates themselves, a lot of people made mistakes. Different people, Ted Cruz, all, all of them made mistakes and they didn't come after the, I think you're right, they probably didn't want the Libertarian Party there. They didn't want, they just thought of it was, well, one show, the only show that had him was, I think, was one or two shows, and I think that's what, you know, they just made fun of it. Mm -hmm. You know, like, the Libertarian Party is kind of a joke. It's never going to happen. It's not going to ever become serious.